Hello, I'm Pearl Jean Mabe, and I would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Webinars are brought to you as a membership benefit of Heritage Ohio. Today's webinar is open to all, but we do invite you to join Heritage Ohio and enjoy our monthly webinar programs. Heritage Ohio's mission is to help people to save the places to mat that matter, build community, and live better. Today, we will have a presentation on using CBD, CDBG, see I can't talk, funding for small town historic preservation projects. We'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please type into the question box at any time. Most issues with the webinar software will be solved if you just close the program and restart it with the link that was sent to you. This webinar has been approved for AIA continuing education credits, so please email me, Pearl, as indicated in the chat box, if you would like to receive credit or a certificate. Our presenter today is Carolyn Thurman. She is a community development analyst with the Ohio Development Services Agency, working in the economic and Appalachian development section. She holds a master's degree in city and regional planning from The Ohio State University and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Case Western Reserve University. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Caroline. All right. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Caroline Thurman. And today we're going to be talking about using CDBG funding for small town historic preservation projects. Sorry. All right, <laughs> uh, so today's learning objectives, at the end of this webinar, you'll be able to understand the CDBG program, have a uh, grasp on the basics of national objectives and eligible activities, and uh, determine any additional requirements when using CDBG funding, and be familiar with state-funded CDBG programs. So the Community Development Block Grant was established in 1974 by President Ford, and it provides federal funding to state and local governments. So it breaks out communities into two groups. There are entitlement communities, which are urban cities and counties that qualify to receive direct federal funding, and there are non-entitlement communities whose funding runs through the state. Um, generally, the more urban cities and counties are entitlement communities, and the more suburban or rural communities are non-entitlement. Um, there's a threshold to become an entitlement community, but a lot of communities are grandfathered in. And um, later, I'll show you a map of who is an entitlement community and who is a non-entitlement community. The purpose of the Community Development Block the Grant is to all attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> start. Oh. I apologize. We thought we had started and we hadn't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. We thought we had started and we hadn't. So we're going to quickly redo what we just did and start over. Um, so, all right. Hi, I'm Pearl Jean Mib, and I would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Webinars are brought to you as a membership benefit of Heritage Ohio. Um, and <laughs> see, I mess everything up here. Today's webinar is open to everybody, but we do invite you to join Heritage Ohio to enjoy our monthly webinar programs. Heritage Ohio's mission is to help people to save the places that matter, build community, and live better. Today we will have a presentation on uh, using CB, CDBG funding for small town historic preservation projects. We'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the question box at any time. Most issues with the webinar software will be solved if you close the program and restart it with the link that was sent to you. This webinar has been approved for AIA continuing education credits, so please email me, Pearl, as indicated in the chat box, if you would like to receive credit for or a certificate. Our presenter today is Carolyn Thurman. Carolyn Thurman is a community development analyst with the Ohio Development Services Agency, working in the economic and Appalachian development section. She holds a master's degree in city and regional planning from the Ohio State University and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Case Western Reserve University. And with that, I will hand it once again over to Carolyn. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Carolyn. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, I hadn't said too much, so I'm just going to start at the beginning of this slide and go over the history of the Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, so it was established in 1974 by President Ford as part of the Housing and Community Development Act. It provides federal funding to state and local governments, and it breaks those governments out into two categories. The first category is entitlement communities, and the second category is non-entitlement communities. Uh, basically, the difference is entitlement communities tend to be larger urban cities and counties, 
so like a Columbus or a Cincinnati um, or a Cleveland, and non-entitlement communities are more suburban or rural cities, villages, and counties that aren't large enough to get their own federal funding, but get funding through the state of Ohio, which administers the program. Uh, later on, I have a map of entitlement communities to kind of show you the breakdown of um, if, you would have, if you would be in the state program or in your own federal program. The purpose for the Community Development Block Grant uh, is to develop strong communities by providing decent housing, a suitable living environment, and expanding economic opportunities, principally for low and moderate income persons. Um, oh yeah, there was one slide I want to go back to. I'm sorry. I want to go back over the learning objectives. Even if it's not uh, related to the program, I just want to be clear about what we're going to cover in this presentation. Um, so the learning objectives, again, to understand the CDBG program, to grasp the basics of national objectives and eligible activities, and to be able to determine additional requirements with using CDBG funding, and to be familiar with the state-funded programs. Uh, one of the things I want to point out, uh, this is not intended to be a end-all, be-all, you'll be able to do your own CDBG program, but to give you enough information to know what types of activities are eligible and to know who to contact if you're interested with doing a CDBG-funded activity. Can we do a question? All right. So we have a question here. How do small and or rural villages participate in CDBG in the CDBG downtown program with their limited resources, capacity, and lack of downtown organization? Could small villages work with an area CIC for an application round? Um, for the state's funded community, or sorry, downtown revitalization program, uh, we do require some sort of incorporated downtown organization, but what a downtown organization consists of is up to the community. So it can be a CIC, it can be a community action agency, it can be a chamber of commerce, it can be a visitor's bureau, but that downtown organiza organization needs to do some sort of uh, business development work in the downtown core and some sort of revitalization work in the central business district. So we can... All right, uh, so some CDBG basics. It's a flexible funding source for projects related to housing, community and economic development, water and infrastructure projects, and human services. It does allow for partnership with the private and nonprofit sectors to address community needs. Activities are initiated and developed at the state and local level based on a community's needs, priorities, and benefits and these activities must meet a national objective. Uh, one thing I will not go over today is there's a sizable um, public participation portion to CDBG. It's, just, it's not too bad. You have to hold a couple public hearings. The state, with its non-entitlement program, holds hearings throughout the year to address the biggest issues in the state and to de develop our programs to um, meet those needs. So national objectives, um, it's broken down into three categories. There's the Low Moderate Income National Objective, or LMI, the Prevention or Elimination of Slums and Blight, and Urgent Need. For the area-wide LMI benefits, LMI benefit is broken into four different sections. There's area-wide, there's limited clientele, housing, and jobs. So area-wide is the most commonly used national objective for activities. Um, it, Pretty much means you have to look at census data or survey data and see if an area is primarily low or moderate income, HUD determines those income levels that qualify as low or moderate income. And if an area is in an LMI, census tract, or block group, or jurisdiction, then the activity benefits if it, or activity qualifies if it benefits the people in that area. For limited clientele, uh, these are groups of people that HUD presumes to be low or moderate income. So these are not groups of people where you would need to, um, to survey them to see what their income is. HUD assumes these groups are low and moderate income. Those groups are abused children, battered spouses, severely disabled adults, homeless persons, illiterate workers, or sorry, illiterate adults, migrant farm workers, elderly persons, and persons living with AIDS. For uh, low and moderate income direct benefit projects, you can do housing and job creation, Pretty much direct benefit means what it sounds like. Uh, these are projects that directly benefit someone who is low or moderate income. So 
So Sloan and Blight, there's two ways to designate a activity as addressing air issues with slums or blight. You can do area-wide or spot. Uh, the difference is exactly what it sounds like. Area-wide is if you have a target area that you want to address issues within, then you would designate that target area as being as having primarily blighted, blighted characteristics or the potential for a future blight. Uh, for a slum and blight spot, it's a specific spot. So the difference between these two things would be, you know, maybe you have an older neighborhood or central business district and you want to do work within the entire central business district, you might want to go slum and blight area-wide. If there is one particular building that you want to address, it would be slum and blight spot. Urgent need is one that I want to highlight. The state does not allow urgent need projects for non-entitlement non communities. Uh, entitlement communities may or may not do something different. That would be something to contact the local government about. Uh, but urgent need is what it sounds like, an urgent need for emergency uh, conditions. So these are generally presidentially de declared disasters. But meeting the timeline to say that it's an urgent need and it, you know, something that just happened is something that needs to be addressed is usually pretty tricky. Uh, so again, this is something you want to check and see if your local community even bothers to do. So eligible activities, it's honestly easier to just say what's not eligible instead of what is eligible because quite a few activities are eligible as long as they either address issues of uh, slums and blight or address barriers to housing or, you know, something that benefits low moderate income populations. Oops, back to slide. Um, so, as you can guess, there's quite a bit that you can do. I just want to highlight a few that are um, more in line with revitalization projects. So you can do public facilities. This can be a neighborhood center, for instance. Acquisition of property, as long as you have an end use in mind. So um, you can't just acquire and hold a property. You have to acquire property for rehabilitation or uh, something else. Uh, we have a question here. Does a nonprofit organization compete with municipal city BG projects? Um, every county that the state gives money to is able to determine their own method for soliciting projects. So most of the time, yes, uh, generally a nonprofit organization with potentially a county or a city if they're a large enough city to receive funding directly from the state, and that county would determine those projects. We have another question here. Can a Main Street program apply for CDBG funding for downtown business districts even though their city also applies for funding to use in other areas? Yes. Uh, the Main Street program for if you're in a non-entitlement area, because I'm speaking again from the state's perspective. So if you're in an entitlement area, you would want to contact your local jurisdiction because they would know how their programs are run. But for the state programs, the Main Street program would apply by contacting their county or city and it is additional funding for what they use for other areas. So the answer to that is yes. Um, so with our eligible activities, we have acquisition of property with an end use mine, facade improvements, building rehabilitation, ADA, ADA compliance improvements, and I, I want to stress improvements with this. It's one of the, the big questions we run into. You can't build something new that's ADA compliant and use ADA compliance as the reason, but if something already exists and you want to make it ADA compliant, then so that could be a, a limited clientele activity. Uh, historic preservation, planning activities, and that includes uh, downtown master plans, uh, any other community planning efforts. It can include engineering fees, uh, things of that nature. And then code enforcement, and this code enforcement can include the service of code enforcement, of actually implementing, implementing code enforcement procedures. I have a question here. Is this an open-ended timeline? Uh, if you were talking about for applying, some of the state's programs are open-ended, but most of them have a June 26th deadline for this year. It's always in June, but this year the deadline is June 26th. Uh, we have another question here. So are historic structure reports and preservation master plans eligible? A preservation master plan is certainly eligible. For a historic structure report, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Do you mean that looks at 
a plan from the community's perspective of what to do or more of specs for what to do to uh, renovate a specific structure. All right, I'll, um, if you could uh, explain a little bit more to me, I'll keep going and I'll come back to your question. Okay, uh, so there are some additional requirements when using CDBG funding. It is a federal funding source. I am not going to go into detail with any of these requirements. I'm just going to mention that they exist. So those um, federal requirements are fair housing and some other civil rights. Uh, environmental review, it has, it's subject to the Uniform Relocation Act in Section 104, and also davis Baking's prevailing wages. Fair housing is usually pretty simple. It's the responsibility of the grant holder. Oops, sorry. Let me go back to that last slide. Uh, most communities in Ohio have been receiving. Let's get to the right slide here. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, most communities are have been receiving uh, CDBG funding from the state for quite some time, so they are already doing this. So it's not something that you would necessarily need to work with solely because you're doing a historic preservation process. But I want to throw it out there because it is a federal requirement. Uh, you have to um, create equal housing opportunities for people in America and prohibit discrimination in housing on the basis of race, color, religion, sex national origin, disability, and familial status. Environmental review. I'm going to very briefly go over environmental review. There are four levels of uh, environmental review you potentially do. Exempt, categorically excluded, subsequently exempt, categorically excluded, subject to 58.5, and environmental assessment. Uh, with historic preservation projects, you're generally going to be in either categorically excluded, subject to 58.5, or the environmental assessment level, which is much scarier than it sounds. <laughs> For the state-funded programs, we actually have a couple people in a compliance section that can walk you through this. And we have a worksheet on our website that tells you exactly what you need to do, where you need to go, what you need to fill out. So it's actually not as scary as that sounds. Um, okay, so going back to the previous question about the historic structure report. So a plan for the rehabilitation of an individual building. Generally, that would be considered more designed for an activity. And you would need to actually, if it's an individual building and not for the benefit of the community, uh, you would want an activity to be the historic preservation or building rehab of that building. And that plan would be allowable as an expense from that activity. But it would not be allowable as, as its own activity. Um, so the environmental review level is determined by the activity type and size. And one of the um, great for anyone interested in preservation uh, factors of environmental review is that you are required to coordinate with OHPO. So if something is a historic property um, or the potential to be in a historic district or anything of that nature, OHPO, uh, you have to go with them with your project and they have to approve the project that you do to make sure that it's not um, in violation of uh, any historic preservation regulations. So I want to briefly talk about the Uniform Relocation Act in Section 104. Um, and this really comes into play a lot when you're doing acquisition uh, and rehabilitation or demolition activities. I know there is a funding source that a lot of communities have been using recently called Moving Ohio Forward, which had no rules attached to it. And so I'm finding that a lot of communities forget that federal funding does have URA um, requirements. So URA applies to any projects funded or anticipated to be funded by CDBG funds. So if you anticipate that you're going to do a project and part of that funding is using CDBG funding, but you haven't received the CDBG funding yet, at that point in time when you had a public hearing or approached business owner or building owners or what have you, that is the point in time that URA kicks in. So really what this is, is it prevents you from just displacing people left and right. Uh, so there are some requirements, e even if you do voluntary or involuntary acquisition of a government, or of a building, sorry, and that's by the government, so acquisition by the government. Um, and then 
it, the displacement benefits apply to both people and businesses. I have a question here. I'm in a non-entitlement community. If I understand correctly, we cannot directly apply. We must go through our county. Probably. Uh, there are a few non-entitlement cities that can apply directly to the state, but yes, you probably will have to go through your county. Um, without knowing where you're from, the easiest way I can direct you to get information is to contact your village council or your city council. They will know if they apply directly through the state or if they go through the county. If you have a project in mind, I would suggest that you contact them soon because, again, the application date for our downtime revitalization and some of our other state-funded programs is June 26. Uh, so David Bacon, this one is uh, an interesting one when you're doing private building rehab especially. So these are federal prevailing wages. Those are those really high construction worker wages that you hear about. It applies to construction work where the labor is over $2,000, and that is for the entire project. So you can't break one project into multiple projects to skirt this requirement. Uh, it's generally pretty obvious if you've broken a project into smaller pieces. So one example, um, there is a chapel that was being preserved, and the front door was treated like one project, and the back door is treated like a second project. That's obviously one project. So um, there are a few exceptions. Some clearance activities and small-scale housing activities do not require Davis-Bacon federal prevailing wages. And if a sole proprietor is doing the work to renovate a building, then that he does not have to pay himself the Davis-Bacon wages, but he would have to pay. Um, you know, obviously, any contractor that has employees would have to pay their employees federal prevailing wages. So um, I just want to show a map. This is actually a map of entitlement communities. So any of these cities listed on this map and any of the counties in red do not go through the state-funded program. But everyone in gray, you're in the state-funded program, so this will be um, extremely useful for you. I'm only this up for a little bit longer, so if anyone's looking for their community, they can see uh, exactly what they're working with. Uh, so I want to talk about one of the state's programs because this is one that has that uh, time, that deadline of June 26th, and it's one of the more popular methods for uh, large-scale downtown revitalization. It's called the Downtown Revitalization Grant, and it's designed to improve central business districts, aid in the elimination of slums or blight, create and retain permanent private sector, and create and retain permanent private sector job opportunities for LMI households. So some examples of uh, eligible activities, it could be to rehabilitate deteriorated building facades, address code violations, and improve blighted streetscapes and infrastructure. This maximum award is $300,000. There's no minimum award, although I will assume most of you need somewhere around $300,000 at least. Um, there is an administration component to the grant that is 15% or $30,000 whichever is lesser. Uh, sorry, we have a question here. Can you please explain a little bit further what you meant by a Main Street organization applying for the city and it being additional funding? Would that be additional funding to the normal allocation? What would the process be? Uh, yes, Sandy, that would be additional funding to the normal allocation. So whatever the community is getting their allocation budget, that still stays the same and any additional competitive set-asides, including the downtime revitalization grant are, on, grant, are on top of the allocation amount. The process is actually similar to the um, to applying for allocation funding. You go through our online ocean system, which I'm not going to get into today, um, but I, I know you're familiar with it, and you can contact me uh, with any specific questions later as well. Um, so the target area must be primarily commercial. Makes sense. Obviously, if you have a residential neighborhood, it's probably not your downtown. Your downtown is probably uh, more of a business district. For the state purposes, 51% of buildings and or, and or infrastructure must be blighted. The communities determine blight by their own standards. Uh, we have a form at the state that you list different types of infrastructure, so streets, sidewalks. Uh, water lines, buildings, parks, whatever you have going on in the target area, and then tell us what is blighted and what is not blighted. 
You must have some sort of incorporated downtown organization. And to reiterate um, the question earlier, it does not have to be a Main Street program. However, we do uh, at the state give some additional points for Main Street organizations. So uh, if you have something that could be a Main Street organization, I highly suggest you look into that. Um, it just has to be an organization that does work in the downtown of your, your community. Have another question here. Do all the gray areas not apply to this program, or must they go through the county they reside? The gray areas are the ones that do apply to this program. Um, generally, can they go back to that map? Sorry, <laughs> having some technical difficulties here. Okay, there we go. Um, so the gray areas do apply for this program, unless you're one that is a uh, city that's listed. There are a few cities that can apply directly to the state. Um, if you could send me the community that you're living in, I can directly address whether or not they apply directly to the state. Um, but if you're in a village or a smaller city in one of these great counties, you would have to go through the county. Okay, we have another question here. Can a county fund a CDBG downtown with multiple communities applying? Um, and would they work with one county CIC or chamber to apply? Uh, well, as of right now, no, it has to be for one community. However, a county can apply for two downtown revitalization grants. Um, that's actually something that quite a few communities have asked about recently, um, which uh, the way the state funds its programs is, again, uh, going back to earlier, it's based on a public hearing, a, notice, a, a series of public hearings. The next public hearing for the 2016 program is in September, I believe. Uh, and that is something that I would like the communities who have interested, interest in this to come out and you know, talk about this being a change to the program. I think that that would be a very uh, good way to get money into more to get money faster out the door, which is always great from the state's perspective, and to put less of a burden on individual communities. Uh, another question here. We are a downtown affiliate member of Heritage Ohio and are a volunteer board. Will we qualify to apply for this grant? Yes, you would. Uh, and I saw the answer to the community earlier. It's Fort Smith, Ohio. Fort Smith can apply directly to the state for funding. Um, and the contact that we have at Portsmouth is Tracy Shearer. She's the Community Development Director, I believe. That's off the top of my head, so don't trust that completely. But it is Tracy Shearer. And if you contact her, uh, she can get you in contact with me, and we can see where the city is for applying for a grant this year. Uh, another question here. Can the incorporated downtown organization be one that organized through the city itself, or does it have to be a third party? Um, if it is solely the city itself, I would not count that as a separate organization, but if it has a lot of business owners in the local level who are heavily involved, then it doesn't matter if the city is the one that started it. All right, going back to the previous slide. Uh, so the last thing on this slide to note, everything you do with this program has to meet the Secretary of the Interior you, Interior's rehabilitation standards. No surprise there. So I just want to go over the different ways we score downtown revitalization grants. Uh, just briefly, uh, we look at distress. We allocate about 10 points to that, and that's a calculation we do in the office based on the LMI percentage of the community, the unemployment rate, and the median household income. All right, we have another question here. Our community is Magnolia, Ohio, and Stark and Carroll counties go through our downtown area. Um, Stark County is an entitlement, so that Magnolia definitely does not receive funding directly through the state, but the com communities that border entitlement and non-entitlement areas were given the opportunity to choose which county they want to go through. So if I were you, I would contact your village or city council and ask. They should know if you're going through Stark County or Carroll County. Another question here. How can communities engage with consultants in order to more easily facilitate these projects, especially for communities without capacity or staff? 
Um, any of these programs can be, well, from the state non-entitlement perspective, we allow consultants for any of these programs, be it the downtown revitalization or a few other programs I'm going to get to at the end of this presentation. There, um, you, you would um, find a consultant the same way you would in any other uh, process with the local community. So going through a request for qualifications and determining which consulting agency you would like to work with. And all of our grant, grant funds have some amount of admin dollars. So if you're worried about uh, paying for a consultant or anything of that nature, there is admin that can be used to pay consultants. So uh, leverage, the reports awarded for the proposing financing mechanism. So one of the big things we're doing differently this year from previous years, years is we're counting leverage as only the, um, the match that goes into the projects that have CDBG funding in them. So pretty much a rule of thumb for anyone who's worked with this project before, if you would be required to get an environmental re uh, release of funds from the state, then that's the leverage activity. If not, it's a coordination activity, and we will count that actually as well, but the points in a different section. So uh, design is 50 points, the largest bulk. Uh, this is where we'll look at coordination. So still in your applications, tell us about all the other privately funded uh, projects happening in your downtown or whatever other community activities are taking place, because we will count that as coordination of showing us that there's some sort of sustainable downtown revitalization efforts going on. Then we also look at organization participation and capacity. Part of this looks at the applicant itself, the grantee, because these grants do get funneled through the grantee uh, with the state and onto the private business owners. And part of this will also look at the strength of whatever downtown organization you have in your community. So that's something you show us. So if we've never heard of you before, that's fine. You just have to demonstrate to us what the organization has been up to. There's a few other state programs that I want to touch on briefly uh, in the Economic and Appalachian Development section. The Downtown Revitalization Grant is generally what people use for historic preservation, but I want to touch on some other ones because, you know, like I said earlier, these are almost always CBG allowable activities. So one is the Allocation Grant Program, where the state of Ohio gives every non-entitlement community some dollar amount. Um, so the minimum floor is $75,000. It goes up to, I think, uh, $350,000 is the largest grant recipient. And under the allocation grant program, you can do some uh, building rehab if it's public facilities, so maybe you have an older library or what have you, or a community center. Uh, and you can do some streetscaping in your downtown area um, or anything of that nature. The Neighborhood Revitalization Grant Program, which is focused more on residential communities, but going back to the example of a, a library, you might have something in a residential community or in a residential neighborhood that you might want to preserve. You have the Critical Infrastructure Grant. This one's probably not as useful for most of the people on this webinar, but you can use it to do work in a uh, commercial area. So if you want to do some street scraping, scaping, this might be the better grant to choose instead of the Downtown Revitalization Grant. We have an economic development program, which is for the creation of low and moderate income jobs, so that direct benefit um, activity that we talked about earlier. But this allows communities to give money to private businesses. So if you have a business you wants to locate in your downtown, this might be a grant to look at because this could be funding to renovate a building. We have the residential public infrastructure grant. This is more water and sewer issues, but if you have, again, a historic community with water and sewer issues, you might want to look into this grant. Uh, revolving loan funds, which I want to talk about a bit. So with CDBG funding, a community has the ability to uh, do projects that maybe they're loans to a private business or, you know, generally loans to a private business, actually. So we'll go with that. Um, and as those loans are paid back, that money stays in the community. So the community has full reign over what goes on with those funds as long as the activity is CDBG eligible. So you can loan it out for a new private business loan, or you can apply to the state for a waiver and do any CDBG act eligible activity, um, and that includes planning. Then there's also the discretionary program. The discretionary program is for more um, smaller single component projects. So 
maybe you have a hotel in your downtown and the hotel owners are interested in uh, renovating that, that building, you could apply through the community for a grant from the state to help offset the cost of that preservation. This, uh, this program is, I mean, it's discretionary, just like the name says, so it's, it, it's pretty loose with the rules, but generally it goes to large historic preservation projects. I have my contact information here. Feel free to contact me with any questions you may have. Um, if you're in a non-entitlement community and you're not sure exactly what your community's process is, I do recommend that you contact your community to see uh, what their local processes are. But at the same time, feel free to contact me. You know, we're here to help. We're here to answer questions. Uh, we have another question here. So you answered a question that said Main Street organizations can apply for CDBG funding. My understanding is that only city and county entities are eligible to receive CDBG downtown funding. Um, maybe I did not say that as clearly as I should. The Main Street organization can work with the city and county. The city and county is the grantee through the state. Generally, the Main Street organization does some of the administration of the downtown revitalization program because they have the connections with the business owners. So it's not that Main Street themselves would necessarily send an application to us at the state, but they are a huge part of a successful downtown revitalization grant. Um, so we have another question here. Would ODSA reconsider the HSR as an eligible planning expense? The National Trust has written some compelling docs on the importance of HSR, and while HSR is focused on a specific asset, the HSR is seen to take in all kinds of community issues. Um, I'd actually like to hear more about that, Mary. Perhaps that is something that could be done as, as a planning activity if it's taking in more community-focused issues. Uh, if you can send me an email about that, I think I'm, I'm now your new field rep anyhow, so we can talk about that further. Uh, another question. Can you talk a little more about the discretionary program? We have a historic theater downtown that is interested in applying for funding. It seems like this would be the best track. Yes, that would absolutely be the best track if you have a historic theater um, applying for funding. So how the discretionary project works is you contact your field rep, and if you don't know who that is, then you can send me an email, I'll get you to the right person, and you give them a kind of like a letter of intent of what you're looking at to do with the project. A few times a year, the powers that be in ODSA uh, compare projects and determine who they want to invite for a pool application. So, you know, it's not that much um, work from the, the, you know, just getting the letter of intent, so I highly advise you do it if you have a project that you're considering. And again, send me an, um, or call me, send me an email. My email address, which I realize now is not on this uh, slide, is just firstname.lastname at development.ohio.gov. And, and Pro will send it out for you all. Uh, next question. Do any of the programs apply for building acquisition or redevelopment? If so, which would be best? Yes, acquisition and redevelopment is an eligible expense where it's eligible activity with CDBG as long as you have an end use in mind. So that end use can be rehabilitation, um, but you can't, again, acquire it and just sit on it. For the answer to which program would be the best, let me go back to the slide with our list of programs. All right. Um, oops, went too far. So... You could really, depending on the, the need that you're addressing, you could do this with downtown revitalization, the allocation program, neighborhood revitalization, um, revolving loan funds, discretionary economic development. You know, those, the infrastructure programs are you know, probably not going to be the most useful if you're looking to require a building. But again, it all depends on what the building is and what the end use is going to be. Uh, if you could, as well, you can email me with the specific project you have in mind, and I can talk through more of what your options would be. Another question. I live in an entitlement city. It is my understanding they receive a certain amount of money each year. Would we be able to partner with them to get additional funding? I know they carefully budget what they already have. We are also interested in restoring a historic theater. If you live in an entitlement city, then unfortunately you would not be able to access any of the state funding. Uh, the general CDBG rules, rules that I talked about early, 
earlier, do apply to all CBG programs, but most entitlement communities don't necessarily have a set aside for one time revitalization projects. I would suggest you contact the community you live in and get them involved with the project and see if they're interested in becoming a partner. Uh, another question, is the revolving loan fund being eliminated? No. Um, I mean, unless your specific community is. <laughs> From the state's perspective, we are not eliminating the revolving loan fund. Sometimes communities think that, you know, maybe they have, you know, $60 or whatever, they're getting $6 in payments a year, and it's not worth it to them to keep it open. And so your specific community could be ending the revolving loan fund. Uh, another question, would a structure on the National Register help or hinder uh, Fairborn Area Building Old Theater? Uh, Fairborn is an entitlement or in an entitlement community, at the very least, if it's not directly an entitlement community. So that depends on what your local entitlement community wants to do for their program. For the state program, it does not matter. Uh, generally, with the older communities especially, it's all you know, 50 years plus or in a historic district. So you're, we don't look at that. We're not going to prioritize one that's on the register versus one that just happens to be also another historic building that's not registered anywhere. Um, another question. My landlord is an elected county official, so he was not allowed to use the downtown revitalization grant due to that conflict. Are there any other conflicts that can arise, such as a building owner is a city or county employee? Um, for conflicts of interest, that is really something that I would recommend you talk to the Ohio Ethics Commission about. Um, generally, when this arises in a downtown revitalization grant, we tell the community to go to the Ethics Commission, get something formal in writing, and then run it by us. Uh, the big issue always seems to stem with, did the business owner intend to use the funds at the time the grant was applied for? So um, perhaps, perhaps not. In that particular case, I advise you to contact the Ohio Ethics Commission. Uh, it's another comment on the HSRs, their planning tool for individual buildings. Um, again, if you as well, with Mary, could send me more information. The issue that I potentially see is that they're for individual buildings and not necessarily for, for the full community. However, um, depending on how it's structured with a greater application, it could be an eligible activity. It just kind of the trick with CDBG is, uh, again, it, like I was saying earlier, it's harder to say what projects are eligible because it all depends on what need it's serving and how it's spun. So um, if you can contact me as well with a specific project, we'll see if there's something we can do. Another question here. We are a city no longer receiving a direct CBG allocation, and in this case, meaning from the state, this is Bell Fountain. If an organization wished to submit for a discretionary program project, would that now have to be done through the county? Or can the city still make applications independent? for the discretionary program. Uh, for the discretionary program, any city and village can apply. It does not have to go through the county. That is the only one of these programs that does not, oh, residential public infrastructure as well, does not have to go through the county. Also, um, smaller communities may have their own revolving loan funds. So it's really whoever the revolving loan fund holder is. It does not necessarily have to go through the county. Uh, another question here, can funds be used for construction of compatible infill building? Um, for the downtown revitalization program, no, but for CDBG as a whole, yes. Do I have any idea of how many CDBG downtown applications I will get this year? I don't. I wish I did. So please tell me if you're thinking of applying. I like to know in advance. Um, a lot of times, especially if you're a new community, you've never done this before, um, there's some pitfalls that people run into in how to structure an application. Um, and, you know, that's why we're here. The staff in, at ODSA is here for training and technical assistance. And we are always more than willing to come do a site visit or help you organize your application or whatever the case may be. So I don't know. I wish I did. Please tell me if you are. Uh, another question here, can a downtown affiliate a mem member apply for the discretionary funds or is the applicant the city village? This is another one where the, um, the private and 
profit sectors have to um, work alongside the city or village. So generally what we see is the city or village applies for a discretionary grant, but that specifically is going to a specific project. So it's not like the city would get discretionary funds and then at that moment they're like, oh, well, we're going to go do something with building X down the street, you know, thanks for your help, but forget about you. It doesn't work like that at all. Uh, when the grant is given, it's given for that specific project. Um, are there any more questions? I'm going to go back to my contact information if anyone uh, wants to jot that down. Oh, we have another question here. How does CDB, how do CDBG grants work with tax incentive programs? Um, they can be additive. We have had uh, potential projects in the past that have worked with state historic tax credits especially. It, it, CDBG doesn't really have any um, restrictions with the other types of funding it works with. So, yeah, if you have some you know, tax revenue or, or what have you, um, that's fine. All right, so that's all I have if no one has any other questions. Oh, we've got a few more. Um, uh, we have, uh, can funds be used for construction of a compatible infill building? Uh, again, yes, they can be with CDBG, but not for the downtown revite uh, question. Um, then we have another question. So our community has an open lot on Main Street where a building burnt down. What is the best program for us to use to purchase the lot? Uh, again, with acquisition, you have to have an end use. So um, probably, assuming this is, this is downtown, probably the allocation program is the best to use because that is a little bit more free with what we, the state, allow people to do. But if the city is planning on maybe purchasing the lot and turning it into parking, that could be an eligible activity for a downtown grant as well. It all depends on what the end use would be. And we had a question on whether or not um, everyone will have access to the presentation afterwards. I just wanted to comment that if uh, we'll be sending an email out tomorrow that will have um, a link to the webinar recording. And if you email us back, you can get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation or a PDF of it, or whatever you request. So just email us when you get your email tomorrow, and yes, you can get the presentation. Another question, what are examples of end use? So um, with acquisition, the end use could be um, paving a parking lot. It could be building a new building. It could be rehabilitating the building that's existing on the structure. Um, and unfortunately, it could also be a demolition, depending on what the situation is. Uh, any more questions? I want to make sure everyone has the ability to type out their questions, so I'll wait a little longer. We'll wait just a few more moments for those of you who might be typing. Um, so we'll give you just a few more moments. Like Carolyn said, if you want to contact her, her, her number's on the screen. We'll also include her email in the email that we send out tomorrow so that you can get in contact her with her if you'd like. So. Um, so we have a, a follow-up question about the conflict of um, the ethics, potential ethics conflicts with downtime revitalization grants. Um, so the question is, what about volunteer members? A volunteer member is not, uh, again, this is one you want to run through the Ohio Ethics Commission, but generally a volunteer member is not receiving any sort of like, financial payout from the Main Street Board or whatever the case may be. So, again, you want to go through the Ethics Commission, but I would not see that being that as a conflict of interest. You know, since the whole point of us having a downtown organization is that there's someone who knows the business owners in a community. Generally, the people who utilize this grant are people involved with the Main Street organization. So that's not necessarily a board capacity, so that could be um, a volunteer or just a due-paying member or whatever the case may be. So I would not see that as an issue, but 
with any sort of situation where you feel uncomfortable, I highly recommend you talk to the Ohio Ethics Commission. All right, well, it seems like we are out of questions. Um, I just want to thank everybody for attending the webinar today. Our next webinar is going to be on May 6th with our very own Frank Quinn, and we'll be talking about using 10, or about the top 10 rules for restoring your house. Or, um, so for our calendar of upcoming events, including our future webinars, please visit us at Heritage Ohio. And thanks, everybody, for a great webinar, and have a great day.